Hi there and welcome to the channel of A Disappointed Man with me Jason Kennedy, The Disappointed Man. Now in this video I'll be speaking about this book, George Douglas Brown's 1901 The House with the Green Shutters. Now when I picked this up I knew nothing of George Douglas Brown, so I'll begin with a brief biographical sketch which is germane to the work itself. Born in 1869 he was the illegitimate son of a farmer and he was raised by his Irish mother and he made his way to the university at Glasgow where he read classics and he then won an exhibition to study at Balliol College, Oxford and A House with the Green Shutters is his only novel. He died just one year after its publication at the tender age of 33 from pneumonia. Now the work itself is an example of Scottish realism and it was seen as a reaction to the prevailing Kayoyard or Cabbage Yard school which presented an extremely rosy picture of Scottish rural life. And we can gauge the strength of this reaction if I just read you a brief passage from the work itself. The break swung on through merry cornfields where reapers were at work, past happy brooks flashing to the sun, through the solemn hush of ancient and mysterious woods, beneath the great white moving clouds and blue spaces of the sky, and Amid the suave, enveloping greatness of the world, the human pismires stung each other and were cruel and full of hate and malice and a petty rage. Now we learn a number of interesting things from this passage, not the least of which is the word pismire, which is an archaic form for and. But what it also points to is the way the work parodies this Kayoyard school and the way the final bitter sentence cancels and destroys all that's come before it. And I would also suggest there's a kind of gentle parodying of the work of Thomas Hardy, who George Douglas Brown was an admirer of. Because in Hardy, we will see the way in which the natural world can be in such sympathy with the characters that there is almost this mystical fusion of nature and human emotion, which George Douglas Brown completely rejects in favour of the hard, unsympathetic, scientific gaze, which is more indicative of realism and which we'd find in the work of a contemporary such as Gissing. And I would say if you wanted a quick way to grasp this novel, it is a mixing of Hardy and Gissing. Hardy in terms of the rural setting and cast of characters and Gissing in terms of literary technique. Now the story centres on the tyrannical figure of John Gawley and at the opening of the novel he is at the peak of his powers having established domination over both his household and the inhabitants of the small town of Barbie having secured a monopoly of the transportation business which at that time before the coming of the railways used horse and cart and the inhabitants of Barbie are united as one in their dislike of Gawley and their wish to see him laid low. But at the opening of the action, this seems a remote possibility. However, what the novel then does is chart the downfall and the complete collapse of the Gawley family, which is not only Gawley himself, but his battered wife, his physically fragile daughter and his feckless mentally fragile son, also called John. Now the story is told in accordance with the principles of realism and for those not familiar with them that means there are three distinct layers to this narrative. The first of which is the objective voice of the anonymous narrator and from them we as readers are supplied with all of the necessary background information to understand the impersonal forces which are bearing down upon all of the characters in the story, chief among which in the house with the green shutters is the coming of the railways, which will of course have grave consequences for the transportation monopoly of John Gawley. The second layer is an interpersonal one and here we can follow all of the politicking and scheming that goes on among the inhabitants of Barbie as they seek to put one over on one another sometimes entering into temporary alliances to do so. And while the stakes can be extremely high, often 
there are no stakes at all and they bring one another low simply for the pleasure of it. And there's one example I'd like to give, which is indicative of the seam of black humour that runs through the novel. And this concerns a literary prize which is offered at the university in the city. And when students from Barbie return for their summer holidays, the winning of this prize is used as a way to degrade them. So let me just read you the passage concerning this. The Rayburn was a poor enough prize, a few books for an essay in the picturesque, but it had a peculiar interest for the folk of Barbie. Twenty years ago, it was won four years in succession by men from the valley, and the unusual run of luck fixed it in their minds. Thereafter, when an unsuccessful candidate returned to his home, he was sure to be asked very pointedly, who won the Rayburn the year, to rub into him their perception that he at least had been a failure. A body would dander slowly up, saying, Aye, man, you've won hame. Then, having mused a while, would casually ask, By the by, who won the Rayburn the year? Oh, it was a Perthshire man. It used to come to our ert, but we seem to have lost the knack of it. Oh, yes, sir, Barbie bred writers in those days, but the breed seems to have decayed. Then he would murmur dreamily, as if talking to himself, Jock Goody was the last that got it here away but he was a clever chap. The third layer is that of the individual. And here we are able to enter into the minds of the characters. But because we as readers have been supplied with all of this background information and also the interpersonal material, we have a very clear understanding of these characters and we can judge for ourselves how well-informed or not they are of what is happening around them. And this, of course, has a bearing upon the decisions they make. And we can see wisdom and we can see folly. And also we can see how the way characters perceive themselves differs from how others perceive them. And this does create an extremely interesting effect, which greatly deepens the sense of tragedy as the action unfolds. Now, one of the challenges facing a realist writer is how they navigate between the three distinct layers of the narrative. And here is where George Douglas Brown really shows some great artistry in the way he uses the Scots language, which is the language which the characters themselves generally speak. The objective narrator uses standard English. And what he does is make use of what's called free indirect discourse. As the objective narrator approaches the transition point, he will slip into Scots, sometimes just a single word. This signals to you as a reader that you're about to enter once again into the minds of the characters. It's extremely satisfying. It's a source of pleasure in its own right. Now, as you may have gathered by now, I was extremely impressed with this novel. And it's such a shame that George Douglas Brown was unable to go on and fulfill the potential that he showed with the house with the green shutters. And what elevates it still further is the climax. Because although we've been anticipating this fateful encounter between John Gawley and his son, when it arrives, oh my goodness, it's such a powerful piece of writing and it just goes on and on. So this book is rightly regarded as a classic and yet somehow it's been neglected. If you have the chance to look into it, I strongly urge you to do so. But for now, I shall wrap up this review by repeating my mantra. Be safe, be strong, and I shall see you anon. But until then, nanu nanu.